So I'm Jeff Bornstein. I'm an internist at UCLA. And I practice in the Porter Ranch office. Um, and I appreciate the invitation to be out here today to, to talk to you all. And so the title of today's talk is A User's Guide to Healthy Aging. And <clears throat> I think it just kind of reflects um, an idea that we all have the same equipment. We're all born with the same equipment. There are no shortcuts to this. We all pretty much know what this comes down to, which is you know, regular exercise and avoiding too much weight gain and eating a healthy diet. But I'll try to put some numbers to that and help people understand where maybe they want to focus their efforts. Okay. So, so there's a few quotes that I really that, that I really liked about aging, right? So this one is, you can live to be 100 if you give up all the things that made you want to live to 100, is Woody Allen. And then Tennyson was a little more poetic. He said, old age hath yet his honor and his, and his toil. Okay, but my favorite is Satchel Page, the catcher from, what, the 50s, was it? Pitcher. Oh, pitcher, sorry, okay. And he said, how old would you be if you didn't know how old you was? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, you know, talk about healthy aging. I want to emphasize why it's so important now more than ever. And I can say now more than ever because if you look at these life expectancy curves, you'll see that we just keep living longer and longer. And, um, I want you to think for a minute about people who are 70, 80 years old when you were growing up. And think about people who are 70, 80 years old now. I don't know, but for me, there's a huge difference. Okay, so, <clears throat> so spend some time here, because a lot of it is about screening. So screening can be for primary prevention, meaning preventing the first disease. And then after that, there's secondary prevention. Um, but mostly what we're talking about here, which means you have a disease and you're trying to, to prevent something other bad things from happening from that disease. But mostly the focus here is, from <clears throat> primary, is in primary prevention. And so the government, just so you know, provides really great resources. The National Institute of Health website has a lot of extremely well-written literature on a variety of topics, and so does the Centers for Disease Control. Um, people can have slides if they want after the talk. There's a hyperlink underneath most of these where you can, it tells you where you could go to get the, the information that I'm presenting here. Okay, so in terms of screening, there's breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening, and cholesterol screening are all really important. Um, so with breast cancer screening, the current recommendations are you could begin at 40, unless there's a family history that would make you want to begin sooner. And you can do it one to two times a year, um, starting at age 40. And then that's more of a discussion. And at age 50, it's a recommendation. And the reason for that is women's breasts are denser when they're younger. And so the chance of a false positive of something appearing on the mammogram to be a problem and later being found not to be a problem is much higher in younger women. So that's why the recommendations don't really say to get screening before age 50. And what's interesting about mammography is what, what we do, we found that we're discovering the same proportion of early stage disease as we did before. So we're not shifting the curve with mammography, which has made some people feel that, um, and some people to postulate that um, certain cancers actually regress. They may show up for a time and then go away on their own. The data behind that isn't great. A lot of it comes from a single group. I think they're in Australia. But there is definitely a belief that that's possible. Um, so just know that if you want to be more aggressive about breast cancer screening, there's a lot of science and thought and argument that goes behind those recommendations. The cervical cancer screening, the cervical cancer rates of mortality have just plummeted from what they were. And we found that it's, a lot of it is due to the human papillomavirus, which is a very commonly 
sexually tra transmitted disease and prevalent in, with high prevalence in the population. Um, right now, the recommendations have changed from every year, from annual screening, to every three years, which is an interesting phenomenon because for many, many years, doctors were rated on whether or not they perform pap smears annually on their patients. And now we're telling them with a change of the guidelines to do it every three years. And it, you know, it's kind of really hard to stop the momentum. A lot of women have been getting pap smears every year you know, for a long time. So I'm just telling you what the recommendations are. They shouldn't begin before age 21, which isn't a problem for this talk. But they um, past uh, age 30, you can start adding a test for HPV, human papillomavirus, and if that test is negative and all the other pap smears have been fine, you can only do it, you can do it every five years. So those are the current recommendations. If you have the vaccine, <coughs> do you need to have that screening at 30? As far as I know, the vaccine, um, they haven't said don't do pap smears in people who are vaccinated, as far as I know. But um, it's a, probably a better question for a GYN if there's any literature on that. But it's a really good question. I, actually, we run into this question all the time of, do I need a vaccine if? And by the way, one that might interest uh, people here is the shingles vaccine. And interestingly enough, if you've had shingles, you still get the vaccine, according to the CDC. Um, Mm -hmm. Many How many times can you get it? I don't. <laughs> some of it depends upon you, your circumstances. Shingles tends to be um, activated when people are very sick or very stressed or for a variety of different reasons. But um, a lot of vaccines work this way, where they're not perfect protection. But if you get them, you reduce your chances of getting the, the thing you're trying to prevent. And sometimes when you get it, then it's much less likely to hurt you. So since we're talking about the shingles vaccine, people know, I don't know if everybody knows, shingles is this painful rash that people can get after they've had chicken pox as a child, which is pretty much everybody. Um, unless you know for a fact that you never had chicken pox as a child, it, it can be very subtle. Um, you know, then you should get the shingles vaccine at age, I think it's 60 is when you start. The, um, unless you, um, I'm trying to think if there's an indication to it sooner. I can't think of one. I think it really is supposed to start at 60, but I do know some people start at 50. Um, the interesting thing about a history of chicken pox is that, for example, I had a patient who was positive that they never had chicken pox as a child. They were absolutely, had been asked many times and he was positive, he'd asked his mother, so I just checked to see whether or not he had antibodies to chicken pox. It were the highest titers I've seen. So he had definitely, and, and sometimes when they're very little, it's hard to pick up. You know, it shows up as a couple little dots or something, and that's all they manifest. If you haven't had the chicken pox, do you need the shingles No. If you knew for a fact, it's hard to know. So what I would recommend, if people think that they weren't exposed to it, which would put you in a small minority, then just, me, my son, or your son. He, he didn't have any of the signs of the measles, at least none that manifested Okay, I would check just to see if he has antibodies. Um, and if he's really never been exposed to it, then shingles is a condition that results from the varicella virus. So if no one's had the varicella virus, they can't get the condition. What it does is it lives in the nerve um, cell bodies, and for reasons that we're not clear on, it just comes out and activates not as chicken pox, but as a, as a painful rash. And what's interesting about this rash is um, the nerves that come from your brain each map out a certain section of your body, like a map. So one nerve owns something like a patch like this, another nerve owns a patch like that. And when people get the rash, they get the rash specifically in the distribution of that nerve. So you'll see a rash that starts here and goes to here and stops, and it's nowhere else. And it's sometimes triangular, somewhat like the shape of the, of the nerve distribution. Um, so if you get the shingles shot, you can definitely get the shingles. It's just less likely. You less, definitely get shingles, it's less likely. And 
Um, I believe it's been shown it's less likely that you'll have the pain syndrome that can follow shingles. What a lot of people don't know about shingles is it's very painful, but when it goes away, in some percentage of people, the pain can last and not go away, even though the rash is long gone. And to my understanding, the vaccination reduces the chance of that happening. So it's a lot like other vaccines we'll talk about. So it's a good segue for influenza and pneumonia. If I've had, I've had the shingles shot, mm -hmm. but if I'm around someone who has shingles, can I get it? Again, you, the shot is not perfect protection. So the short answer. You can catch it from someone. The way we get shingles, if we haven't been exposed before, is usually through um, reactivation of the virus in it. So I don't know for certain. I really don't know for certain. It's, I, I'm inclined to think not, okay. but, I w and that's another good point about shingles, which is um, you're contagious when you have shingles, just like you're contagious with a chicken pox. So you'd want to stay away from small infants and immu immunocompromised people, very old people. Is there a question? I had a shingle shot, and about a year and a half later, I came down with shingles, but I didn't have the pain at all. Mm -hmm. I just had the rash. Right. And that, that, that is one of the benefits of vaccination many times. Um, and since we're on the topic, influenza vaccination is one I really like because um, we have fatalities in the United States in, among young, otherwise healthy people from influenza. And people just don't realize that. A lot of times bacteria can infect on top of a virus. So sometimes it's the influenza virus directly, complications of it, and sometimes it's a pneumonia that will, um, a bacterial pneumonia that follows the influenza, um, the bout of influenza. But, um, you know, as you've probably read, the vaccine every year, they're trying to guess what the next year's strains are, and sometimes they do a better job of others. Sometimes the shot works better than others. But um, if you get the shot, chances are, that you will have a less severe course of the flu. So um, I actually started at UCLA only last December, and everybody I saw had the flu, it seemed like, and within two weeks I had the flu, and I'd had the flu shot, but I had it for two days. And I was sick and had a fever for two days. I've had patients who had it for two weeks. So, you know, there's a lot of benefit to vaccinations that goes beyond complete protection against getting something. And the same is exactly true with the uh, vaccines against pneumonia, against specifically pneumococcal pneumonia. So pneumococcus is a bacteria, it's the most common cause of pneumonia, and it also has the ability to invade the body, it's called in invasive pneumococcal pneumonia, and that can be deadly. And so getting the pneumonia shot reduces the chance of getting pneumonia from pneumococcus in the first place, and secondly, reduces the chance of getting disseminated pneumococcus. Um, it's actually now two shots, bless you. It's actually now two shots. Uh, one shot you get one year when you turn 65, and a different shot, but for the same bacteria that you get the next year. And there are some people with certain diseases who are supposed to get it sooner, one of the, the groups of people I see who should have it who don't often are diabetics. People who have diabetes are supposed to get the, flu, uh, get the shot against pneumonia. Shots. Is that bacteria like airborne? How do you pick it up from the air or is it in the body? It's both. It's, um, it's one of the bacteria that's all around us in the environment oh. and the type of bacteria that can colonize people I mean, just live without causing disease. It's just a very common form. Um, have you heard of Streptococcus? That's the genus. It's uh, just um, uh, all over the environment and we're exposed to it all the time. Okay, so the next thing is about keeping up to date with, with preventive services. And I'm sure this is like really hard to read, so I'll, I'll read it to you. Um, so collectively, women, um, should have pap smears until they're no longer indicated, and then they should have breast cancer screening and colon cancer screening. And for men, uh, it's, and, um, and everybody should have the influenza shot. And for men, it's more about colon cancer screening at age 50. So everybody should have colon cancer screening starting at age 50 
unless you have a, a first-degree relative or you're at some high, higher risk. So if you have colon uh, cancer in your family, um, unless you want to talk to an expert, but the rule of thumb is if it's a third generation or second generation or really not that close to you, you're supposed to have screening begin 10 years before that person in your family developed colon cancer. So just as a rule of thumb, but you definitely want to consult an expert before trying to figure out when you should start. Why don't they do any kind of screening for uterine cancer? So the pap smears don't do squat. That's right. Well, gratefully, <laughs> uterine cancer. You know, they will not tell you that you've got uterine cancer. Right. It's true. Um, the rate of uterine cancer and deaths from uterine cancer has also gone way down, even though we don't screen for it. Um, we also don't screen for ovarian cancer, which is the one that, that people bring up the most. So screening tests are a delicate balance between finding people who have a disease and not telling people who don't have a disease that they do. So you're trying to maximize um, your detection of a disease without, um, and they kind of work against each other. The more likely you are to detect someone who has a disease, the less likely you are to be accurate. So that's called, so the first one's called sensitivity, your chance of catching someone who has the disease, if they have it. The second is called specificity, which is accurately saying that someone has a disease when they do have it. And um, so screening tests are usually followed by second tests. And those tests are more specific. So we'll screen for breast cancer, right? And if we see something in the mammogram, then we do a biopsy or, or a diagnostic mammogram with an ultrasound. So we're following up screening tests, which usually aren't used for making diagnoses, with diagnostic tests. But at that point, we've collected the population who's most likely to have that disease, because they screen positive on the screening test. And we're unlikely to have left other people who have the disease behind undetected. So when they make these recommendations, what they're looking at is what is the chance that we're going to uh, catch the disease in somebody versus how many people will be false positives. And for, at least for ovarian cancer, it, the equation keeps on coming up that, um, that it's really the, the methodology we have currently for screening for ovarian cancer does not meet the standards of a screening test. That said, there has been a recent study uh, which did show mortality reduction with a certain screening regimen. So for me, I wait for the guidelines because the guidelines are usually formulated by experts who go through the literature in a very methodical way and um, really come up with the best composite that, you know, much better than somebody who's not an expert in that field could come up with of the, uh, of the data and what, you know, what the best knowledge we have at that point in time is. So the guidelines for ovarian cancer haven't changed, screening haven't changed. Um, and we don't screen for uterine cancer. And I haven't seen many studies in, in trying. So I don't know why, but I haven't seen many studies in trying. It might be because it's in the United States, just not that common compared to other cancers. Which doesn't mean it's not important. And I've had a lot of very sick patients with uterine cancer. Um, but the best answer I can give you is it, it either based on how um, common it's seen, its prevalence, and the, met and the methodology that we have to look for it, uh, it doesn't meet the standards for a screening test. The other thing, Cost does factor into screening tests. When, when um, especially the government makes recommendations, they do consider cost and whether or not it costs a lot of money for every person that you were to catch. So you can imagine if it costs you know, $100 million to catch somebody, you might say, well, I really don't, I want to save that person, but we probably can't afford that as a society. So usually it's not that dramatic, but you should know that they do factor cost into their, um, into their decisions on guidelines. Um, so another thing, another thing that I have a lot of discussions with my patients about, 
something that is so bad, it's like a really bad disease, only it's not a disease, it's physical inactivity. And physical inactivity is, you know, think of a really bad disease, most of the ones you're thinking of, physical inactivity is worse. And it's even been shown that people who have desk jobs where they sit all day, even if they get up every once in a while, it makes a difference. So if you find yourself moving in any way, shape, or form, then you're probably doing something good for your health, as long as you're not hurting yourself when you're doing it. Um, I mean, that said, that's not the guidelines for exercise. So the, there's different guidelines for exercise requirements. Uh, one of the standard ones says 30 minutes three times a week. And that's not just like walking the dog. That means with your heart rate elevated, appropriate for your age, and um, that it stays there for like 30 minutes. I've had construction workers tell me, you know, I'm working all the time. But it really, you know, when you talk to them about the kind of work, they realize that they're definitely not getting 30 minutes of elevated heart rate consistently three times a week. Now there is an additional um, recommendation two times a week for weight training. So I don't mean lifting heavy weights, but exercising muscles um, is really good for supporting joints. And lean body mass, when you take out the fat, our lean body mass is associated with how healthy we are. Muscles also eat a lot of glucose, whereas fat tissue resists the actions of glucose. So when people have higher glucose, even if they don't have diabetes, the advice is to lose weight and to put on muscle if you can, because the combination of the two would lower glucose a lot. To, the, to um, a study done a long time ago in um, people who had diabetes, and I think they were all age 70 or older, um, and they were all obese and they went through a weight loss program and they lost a substantial amount of weight. And after that, half of them weren't diabetic anymore. They did not meet criteria for diabetes. So we'll get back to this, but remember that we're talking about the machinery we all own. It's not good to be inactive. It's not good to have too much fat tissue being overweight. Um, and you definitely want to keep up with your screening tests to avoid preventable disease and your vaccinations. Um, and you want to eat a healthy diet, which we'll talk about more, which is actually in some ways a separate subject from weight loss. So if you really want to talk about a bad disease, cigarette smoking would rank really high because the impact of cigarette smoking well, not just cancer, but heart disease and strokes, um, in addition to um, people who are incapacitated from lung disease, is horrendous. And I'd like to share with people, um, if you have any doubts about what doctors actually think themselves about the literature around smoking, uh, I remember coming across something one time which said around 1970, about 90% of doctors smoked. You know, it's a high stress job, you know, you're really busy and I could believe it because my dad was a doctor and I can't remember anybody who didn't smoke, who we knew. Um, but by 1990, 10% of doctors smoked. So I just look at that as, and I'm not even sure, I mean, I read it one time, I'm not even sure if those are exactly accurate, but the trend certainly is. Massive shift in smoking among doctors. What about that vaping thing? Yeah, so that hasn't, um, we don't have enough information to really comment on it. Um, whether or not the chemicals that are in the vapor are bad for us is really an open question. I just think any time that you're putting something industrial in your lungs, it probably isn't as good as not putting it in your lungs, just don't know how bad. My son works in an office and all day long, just sitting there, it's like a cloud. And my concern is, Sometimes the kids go in there, and uh, I, I know smoking is bad, secondhand smoke, but what about this? Same job I, yeah, I don't know. I, I personally don't know, and I'm not sure if we as a profession have enough data to really quantify any risk if a risk is present. So we have to wait until a lot of people start keeling over. <laughs> 
cancer before we know that? You know, for these public health things, a lot of times that's the way it seems because whenever we rush into something, we end up hurting more people than we help. So, you know, um, the idea that first do no harm is, is still a principal idea in medicine. You know, you're, you want to help people. So somebody walks in to your office and they have a problem and your first instinct is to want to help them, but you've learned over time um, and by training to hold back and be very objective and decide really what is the right, the best thing for the person as opposed to the thing that seems like it suits your need to act suddenly and decisively. So I think uh, that really applies to public health a lot. So, um, and a lot of these things have evolved over time. You know, the debate on smoking and whether or not it was really harmful and then how harmful it was went on for decades. Um, binge drinking. Binge drinking is kind of interesting. First of all, I don't know if you'll know this, but alcoholism is highly prevalent among the elderly. So a lot of people don't know that. No, it's, it's really a problem. And you can imagine a lot of the stressors that come with getting older and the reason why that might happen. But, but, what, but what people don't know as much is binge drinking. Binge drinking is defined as having five or more drinks in a given day. So, well, you say that, but I have people, typically younger, who come into my office and say, I only drink on the weekends. OK, fine. How many drinks do you have? Seven <laughs> on Friday, seven on Saturday. The, the, it's not only physically bad, but increases the risk of developing alcoholism eventually. So I usually have this conversation with uh, my college age patients saying, you know, you do what you do in college, but, and it's not a good idea, and it's not good for your health, but whatever you do, if you find yourself doing the same thing after college, it's a problem. Anyway, um, so if you wanted to categorize it this way, obesity is another disease for the reasons that we were, you know, we're talking about. Obesity has a huge negative impact on people's lives, but what I think doesn't necessarily, uh, isn't necessarily recognized as much is how much it reduces quality of life. So who of you ever lost a lot of weight or know people who have? What's the first thing they say? It's like, I feel so much better. You know, I have so much more energy. But it's, it's more than that. Um, one of the most frustrating things for me in medicine is all of the pain caused by osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is really just wear and tear disease of the joints. And I suppose if we live long enough, all of us would get it in our major joints at one point or another because we just keep using them and they're not meant to be used forever. But if you can imagine with obesity, you're putting more pressure on those joints. So I have, it seems like, two populations of older patients, you know, people 70, 75 bouncing from the tennis court, tanned and happy and everything's fine. And I have some patients in their 50s who are overweight who seem like they're dragging themselves into the office with all this pain from osteoarthritis. So I think that's one of the things that we don't talk enough about when it comes to obesity. And none of this, none of this has to do with the aesthetics of obesity. And it is um, an index that you can easily follow. There's something called the body mass index. You can, there's a million calculators on the web. It essentially adjusts your weight for your height and is definitely not the best uh, tool in the world, but it's, it's reasonable to follow it and it's not that much worse than anything else we have. Um, and so if your body mass index is over 25, you're overweight. And if it's over 30, you're technically obese. Class 1 is 30 to 35, and class 2 is 35 to 40, and after 40, it's called morbid obesity. So if you want to know where you stand, just put your height and weight into a BMI calculator, and you'll get some idea. Who came up with those figures, doctors or insurance companies? Um, I don't really know that insurance companies ever really came up with these numbers. I think these are derived from epidemiological studies of at what levels do people run into trouble. And a lot of these things that are, are derived from observational studies have limitations. Because with observational studies, you do your best, you know, you're comparing groups. 
and you do your very best to make sure that the groups are comparable. Um, and the only thing that differs is in whether or not they get this disease. And then you look at what, what was different than those other things that you, that you matched for. That's how epidemiology works, but the problem is you don't know what you don't know. So you can't measure everything, and you don't know everything that you're supposed to measure. So at the end of the day, when you're reading these big studies in the newspaper about, you know, have you noticed it keeps changing with diet and blood pressure and everything else? Well, blood pressure is a different topic, but diet and a lot of things seem like they fluctuate up and down in terms of what we say. A lot of those fluctuations come from that they're observational data. And the, the really solid data is on is clinical trial data, um, where we use techniques that really balance the group. So we have a much better chance of finding a causal relationship, whereas for observational studies, it's just an association. You can't derive causality from an observational study. So when you're reading, the next time you're reading the newspaper, or looking on the internet, and you see someone saying they found such and such and such, um, try to figure out whether or not it was a clinical trial or just they took a database with hundreds of thousands of people and asked a question and got an answer. So, and it's, it's really important observational data for generating questions that we can then answer in clinical trial data. And sometimes it's the only data we have, so it's certainly better than guessing. But I just want you to know the limitations of some of the data um, that you read about, and the reason, which I often get asked, is why do we keep changing, medicine doctors keep changing what they say is, you know, good for you. And that's part of the reason. But the BMI doesn't take into consideration the frame, the body frame. And the body frame has a lot to do with the kind of brain that someone That is true. What it doesn't do a good job um, is muscular people. It overestimates their, um, you know, their weight. Or, or the significance of their weight. And um, there is something better, which is called waist to hip ratio, which speaks to the issue, yeah. It's just um, really easy to fi figure out your BMI. You step on a scale, your height's not changing, right? It's a little harder to follow your waist to hip measurement. But you're right. That's why I said BMI is not the best tool we have. Okay. Um, High blood pressure. Um, high blood pressure is something that half of us get by age 65, and about two thirds of us by age 75. And um, when you think about your blood pressure, understand that the incidence of cardiovascular mortality goes up starting at 115 over 75. So we define a certain threshold as being high blood pressure. But below that threshold, or right below it, doesn't mean that it's not harmful. It's just when we define a threshold of hypertension, we're actually defining a point at which if somebody can't reduce it by optimizing a healthy lifestyle, then we treat them with medications because it's been shown that that reduces cardiovascular mortality. And if you ask a lot of people how long does that take, they'll say decades, and it's not true. If what they've done in high blood pressure, which is great, is they've pooled a lot of data from clinical trials over the decades. And if you do that, depending on the population, it can be several years before you see a difference in people who are treated to different blood pressures, not decades. Um, the other thing that, there's a few things about high blood pressure to tell you. Uh, there's one major society that says you can't even diagnose it based on office readings should only be based on home readings. Uh, the rule of thumb when, when I was learning about this was you needed three office readings on different days. Um, I still think that some guidelines agree to that, but know that home readings are a better predictor of outcomes than office readings. So I give a lot of my patients uh, instructions on how to take home readings because it's very easy to take your blood pressure and get an inaccurate number. One of the most important things is choosing the right size of the blood pressure cuff you're using. But there's other things about not needing to go to the bathroom at the time that you are checking your blood pressure, not having just had um, caffeine or tobacco, having rested in a quiet room for at least three minutes, holding your arm at the level of your heart, where to place the cuff. There's a, there's a bunch of things. And a lot of my patients who have uh, elevated blood pressure in the office, 
they go home and they send me blood pressures because that's what I ask them to do. A week or two weeks of done twice a day. And a lot of them are not hypertensive. They, have, they may be pre-hypertensive, but they're not hypertensive. And it becomes a motivation for people to optimize a healthy lifestyle. And in that case, reduce their intake of salt as well. Now, not everybody is salt sensitive, but a lot of people are. So since you won't know one way or another, if you have high blood pressure, um, it really is, you'd really like to avoid um, added salt. The salt that's in packaged foods, the salt that's in canned foods, the salt that's in restaurant foods, sauces, it's everywhere. Because it, it's a preservative and it makes things taste better. Do you ever take, in your office, do you ever take the blood pressure from both arms? Yeah, technically you're supposed to. So. Um, it's interesting because I just read something we're teaching medical students and it didn't say this, but, but what you're really supposed to do is take the blood pressure in both arms and then forever after use the one in which the pressure was higher. Now typically we take it in the left arm, which more often has the higher blood pressure. It's not necessarily equal in both arms, um, but, but you're actually you're absolutely right. You're really supposed to take it just in case you're a person who's got higher blood pressure on the right than the left. Those are from 1988 guidelines. They've been around forever. 1988? I believe so, yeah. What about those wrist um, OK. Signals? It's hard for me to keep up um, with you know, the proof behind those things. I can only tell you that most of the clinical trials that we've ever done that give us an understanding of blood pressure, its significance, and the benefits of treatment did not use wrist monitors, is my best answer. I know they were considered to be highly inaccurate at one time. Like everything else, I'm sure the technology has improved. So I can't really answer it, but I do ask all of my patients to please get an arm cuff because I can't answer that question. And unless it's really, really hard for them, at which point I would rather have some data than no data, then that's fine. I mean, if it's really hard for you to, and it is, it takes some coordination to take your own blood pressure. Um, and if you find it difficult, then definitely a wrist monitor would be better than, than just counting on your doctor's visits. Is there a difference between holding an arm up like this or propping up a pillow? Yes, you you should be, it should be resting. It should be resting and as close to the level of your heart as you can get it. Wow. And you're supposed to actually not just take one reading. And you have to wait a couple of minutes between readings in order for the blood that you've trapped in your arm to return back to where it belongs before you take another reading. I, you know what I should do? It's asked so many times. I should just put those instructions on a slide. Thank you. I will do that. You know, because it's, I, and I give it to my patients all the time. Well, it's so many patients. Just to get back to your, um, your tests and everything, which I've been hearing a lot lately about hep C testing, mm -hmm. especially for baby boomers. Exactly. So the current guidelines are every baby boomer should be tested for hepatitis C once, unless they have specific risk factors in which you might test them more, but the screening in an otherwise healthy population. Um, and the reason is a very simple one. We found lots of people who are in the baby boom generation who had cirrhosis. And we had no idea. They never knew they had hepatitis C. We never knew they had hepatitis C. And it was prevalent enough. So when the government says test everybody or test a large group, there's usually, usually a huge amount of data before they make sort of a population-based rec recommendation. They certainly don't do it lightly. But this isn't a type of test when you go into the doctor for you know, prescribing all kinds of tests to be taken. This isn't something that they're automatically doing. It is if you see me, <laughs> as well as an HIV test. Which is really, you know, seems kind of silly to people who say, well, you know, I've been married for 50 years and never been sick, whatever. All I can tell you is the current government guidelines are that everybody should be tested for HIV once. Everybody's 18 and older, one time. Of course, if you have specific risk factors, you should be tested more often. But you're supposed to be tested at least once in a lifetime. So that's, as long as, when you're in the office, you know, I. I I'm always surprised when someone says, do I have to do this? Yes, of course not. You don't have to do anything. You know, our job is to tell you what we know and then kind of talk to you about what matters to you and figure out the best path forward for you. But my conversations will always include, with, with new patients, an HIV test. And at least the adults, because so it's, it's all new patients. Um, 
And if they're a baby boomer, then hepatitis C. Okay, so the other thing about high blood pressure, go ahead. So I'm really glad you asked that, because that's exactly what I was going to start talking about. Um, this is a little bit frustrating. I've been working in this field for a really long time. I used to do some research in it. And we used to think we knew what we were, you know, we had a hard and fast threshold for what was high. Now there's been some debate, particularly among older people. So long ago, there was a study called the SHEP study. And it took older people, and they all had blood pressure over 160, over 90. And it showed that, well, back then, that was nothing, actually. People, you know, you know, people from other countries, older people in my clinics, I've seen like 220, and they've been like that for years and years. So um, as I've gotten older in practice, the blood pressures have been coming down that I see. But in that case, at 160, which wasn't considered very high, and they gave them a water pill, and there was a dramatic decrease in mortality. But the real question was, is it better to be below 140 over 90, which is the threshold we use for adults in general? And um, one of the societies recent, recently came out with saying, and there was a, a big debate, that it's actually lower than 150. Now there's more data suggesting, again, 140. I mean, we know we want it lower than 140 over 90. We debate whether or not we want it lower than 130 over 80. But um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because what's driving the debate is the harm that you can do from lowering blood pressure too much, especially in the elderly. So whenever somebody is feeling bad because of their blood pressure medications, feeling bad meaning feeling lightheaded, feeling dizzy, particularly you'll see it first getting dizzy when you stand up, that's a reason to talk to your doctor about your blood pressure medications. And it may have nothing to do with them, but it's, it's worth a discussion. So um, to the... There are some medical conditions in which, for a variety of reasons, hormones that are missing or other problems, we need to treat to those issues in order to raise blood pressure. But we generally do not treat, generally, do not treat low blood pressure as a condition. Well, I think when your blood pressure goes really high, it can be for many different stressors when it suddenly goes up. So if I test someone's blood pressure in my office and it's high and they're in pain, I test it a different time. Because pain, just pain, will drive up blood pressure. Exercise raises blood pressure while you're exercising. Um, different stresses, stress of a heart attack. Um, so life stress can, um, so you know, what we tell everybody, because exercise is really good for reducing anxiety as well and helping cope with stress. So we try to get everybody who has high blood pressure to not have extra weight, not eat, add salt to their food, um, exercise regularly, and um, that can help reduce both anxiety and blood pressure. And, the link, the direct link over a long period of time, I don't know. But it does seem that um, back from the research a long time ago about type A personalities, you know, that there is a link between stress that you have on a daily basis and, and blood pressure. I just don't know enough about the scientific data behind it to really tell you more than that. How reliable are those drugstore blood pressure medicines? I don't know. I wish somebody would study it. They're used so often. But what I do tell my patients is it's fine. Um, I mean, my patients generally can afford a machine. They're like 
twenty dollars for the cheap ones, maybe forty or sixty dollars for the better ones. So, so if you can afford it, get a home machine because one thing I know about, if you notice, they hold your arm at at heart level. To, to the question, you know, your arm is resting at heart level based on where the seat is positioned. Um, but it's almost never going to be a quiet environment for three minutes, which is like the minimum of what you're supposed to have. So that's what I tell people, which is um, I'm not, I have no idea of their accuracy, how often they're tested and calibrated, and how often they should be. And I do know that they, they don't fulfill some of the requirements that we have for taking accurate blood pressure measurements. Okay. Is there a hazard in having low blood pressure? Um, so. What is, what is a normal low that's healthy? Okay. So you definitely don't want it to be less than 90 over 60 if that's where you live. Although I, ha I have some patients who have very low blood pressures. They walk around with 85 over 55 and they feel fine. In that case, it's fine. But the data are that blood pressure is what's called a J-shaped curve. Okay, so mortality, first, go, it goes up as blood pressure goes high, but it also goes up as blood pressure goes very low. So the final curve looks like a J. So people who are there naturally and that's their blood pressure, I would assume it's fine. People who become that way would want to look for a cause as to why they became that way. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's always been that way. Yeah, so it's normal like that. Yeah. Speaking about blood, what's the oldest age that you could donate blood? I don't know the answer. That's a great question. I have no idea. I think they do have an age bar. It's interesting. I literally have never heard that question. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's something I have to look up. Oh, she's probably, yeah, 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 yeah. She's probably AB positive or something like that. I think you physicians need to test your medical assistants because there's a whole lot of medical assistants that are not taking good blood pressure. Sorry, I just, yeah, no, I agree. I'm sorry, I got a bad thing. My staff to be so careful with it and then to go in another physician's office and they're horrible. It's not my job to correct them. Um, I do believe we don't spend enough time teaching people and reinforcing how to take blood pressure. And I'm sorry, I have to get back to something you said. I said exactly the opposite. They're probably O minus, because then they're safe. If they're AB positive, they can get blood from anybody. But if they're O minus, then nope, they have nothing that people object to. Not exactly true. There's less important proteins that matter in blood donation, but not as important as the ones that we measure. I would guess. I would, I would guess. Yeah, a lot of transfusion. They do a lot of transfusion medicine, and they do a lot of transfusions and blood storage. Excuse me. Is there a safe weight loss pill for obesity, for seniors? I'm not sure there's a safe weight loss pill for anybody. Um, where people get into a difficult situation where they have aches and pains that prevent them from exercising. And so it prevents them from doing the things that might help them lose weight. But a lot of people don't realize for cardiovascular exercise, you can use your arms. You don't have to use your legs. You can get a great cardiovascular workout with your arms. Um, I do, all I can tell you about weight loss is I haven't seen any studies that have shown, and they may be out there, but I've never seen any studies that have, large, well done studies that have shown improvement in outcomes or even equivalent outcomes in people who take those medications. I do think they don't seem to work in everybody though, because you always have people who are taking them and, and then you never know what part is the person and what part's the medication. So to give you an um, interesting study that showed that Exercise was associated with weight gain. 
And the, yeah, the, I, the editorialists and I think the authors thought that people got hungry and then they also felt they could relax a little bit, you know, because they're exercising so they didn't have to be quite so strict. You can easily uh, overeat the calories that you just burned off. Oh, yeah. It's like, it's not hard at all, right? Think about that when you take, you know, those, those nutrition bars or those sweet drinks and things like, you know, to give you extra energy. Um, weightlifters load up on carbs and, you know, just think about the fact that um, you can easily, the average population, not the athletic population, can easily overcome the benefits of, of exercise by uh, the way they eat. Is there a question? A huge role. Because some people live to be 100 and they drink, you know, every day. It's and smoke and bacon. And bacon. <laughs> and other people do all of it and they die at 50 and whatever. A couple of people come to mind with that. George Burns, who smoked his whole life, right? I don't know if he drank, but if he did drink, then his chance of esophageal cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer is 50 times what the average population is. So that's just, those aren't odds I would personally play. And it obviously worked for him, but I, you know, I think it'd be like going to a jackpot after someone just won it, going to the same machine and thinking you were gonna win. <laughs> um, another person uh, who comes to mind, I don't remember his name, he had a strong family history of early heart disease at a time before we had effective drugs to treat it. And I think he was the one who popularized the jogging craze, like in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I always forget his name. Um, and I, what I remember reading was that when he died, and he died of a heart attack, and he died in his early 50s, his coronary artery was something insane, like an inch or some crazy measurement, which, and it was full of plaque. And what it tells you is that whatever he did make him, made him live a lot longer than his genes would allow. So um, there's a very popular saying now that genes are not destiny. And a, and a good, a good study to illustrate that is a recently published study where they looked at People who have bad genes had a risk of dying from cardiovascular disease that was twice that of the normal population. And if they did the right things, they got their risk down to the normal population. There were people who had good genes, and I'm simplifying a little bit, it's not perfectly accurate, but it's mostly, mostly what the article showed was that the people with good genes, if they didn't do the good things, their level of risk rose to the people who had bad genes. So genes are not destiny, but they certainly influence things. You mentioned, um, you know, doing your exercise and then snacking and, you know, and, you know overdoing that. Um, on, right now you're hearing a lot that I have to get more protein and I need more protein and I need more. What is enough protein, and what happens when you get too much protein um, at our ages? Yeah, the, I do not know the nutritional grams that you're supposed to get, um, but those government websites are where I would go. If somebody asked me that, the exact grams. So people would... You know, there seems like to be an obsession to well, overeat protein. things that are overloaded artificially I agree that there seems to be an obsession, and I don't know about their health benefits. I know for certain people with certain diseases, especially kidney disease, you definitely don't want to overload the body with protein. But um, again, a lot of this is based on observational data. And I think there was, I think it was called the PURE study, which literally just came out. It was 130, you'll probably read about it. 135,000 people in maybe Denmark, somewhere in Europe, they studied them for seven years and found that the people who had the highest fat intake were the ones who did the best. 
and the ones who had the highest carbohydrate in, intake did the worst. So the carbohydrate, but I wouldn't take that and run with it because there's too many other studies. We have well-controlled studies that show that certain diets um, increase, uh, I mean, decrease cardiovascular disease and may actually decrease some forms of cancer. So there have been some head-to-head -head studies that were extremely well done that showed that places like Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig, they actually lost weight. People did definitely lose weight. They compared it to non-commercial diets. One was called, is called the DASH diet, which has been around forever. And uh, it emphasizes lower salt. Um, but the problem with it, it has really improves cardiovascular outcomes, but a lot of people find it hard to stay on. So when you think of diet, um, it's better to think of it as a menu. So one good example, so another diet, which in the specific head-to-head -head study I'm thinking of, came out really on top or near the top in every category of benefit they were looking for is called the Mediterranean diet. Well, what I like about it is it's the easiest one to stay on. And uh, one of the best editorials that I've read that looked at a lot of these studies said the best diet, since the differences between diets don't appear to be that large, the best diet is the one that your patients can stay on. Sir? How about liposuction after 50? <laughs> What's the question? <laughs> Oh. Some of us have, you know, our fat just goes right to our, bottom, our you know, torsos. <laughs> Everything else is skinny, but then you have a lot of fat there. I've never seen an article extolling the cardiac benefits or, or, or health benefits. <laughs> Although I imagine, you know, for really heavy people, there, there could be. Right. I mean, but, so I'm not talking about like the 600 pound. Yeah. Shows, but I'm talking about someone who could lose. Right. I've never seen any information to address that. But I will tell you one thing. Um, when I was in medical school, I basically felt like fat cells were bags of fat. That's kind of what they weren't, didn't do anything else. They were storage cells. That's not true. They're metabolically active, and it matters. The hormones that they make affect our health. But not all fats created equal. And some of the fat uh, that seems to be more important is the fat that's under our stomach muscles, not above. And there you're not doing liposuction. So my inclination would be to say you might be getting rid of fat cells, but the more metabolically active ones you may not be getting. But I don't know that for sure. I'm just telling you the, uh, the extent of what I do understand about this. Um, so the Mediterranean <laughs> diet, I think you want to get your information from a good source because um, I had a patient, for example, who said, I don't need that. I'm from the Mediterranean. I eat Mediterranean food all day long. So I said, oh, so lots of meat? He said, tons of meat, <laughs> tons of red meat. So not everybody's Mediterranean diet is, you really want to go to the literature where they describe, like the government uh, or scientific literature, where they, they really describe what they mean. And then it's better to think of it as a menu. Because dieting is something, you know, you think about eating carrot sticks, losing weight, and then going back to the same habits that made you heavy in the first place, which is why people yo-yo with their weights. So um, I like the Mediterranean diet. I, I call it in my office the Mediterranean menu. And it's like if you eat off this menu, you're probably going to do a lot better than if, if you were just, you know, to pursue bad habits anyway. I, I don't, we have, we have a, com I would check, the, again, the government websites are very highly curated. Another source is what's called PubMed, but there's a version of PubMed, which is run by the um, Library of Medicine uh, in, you know, in Washington, National Library of Medicine, and there's a version which has a lot of information for patients, and you might look there, and certainly you could check the, um, um, the government websites, the National Institutes of Health. Sorry. Doesn't the Mediterranean diet have a lot of pasta in it? Yes. Carbs. Yeah. Carbs get yeah. the blood sugar up. That's absolutely true. So on balance, though, the problem is, is 
in some level, I think we're trying to separate individual things and blame them, but it's probably something about the mixture of how we do things that matters more than the individual components that we, that we section out. Um, but I have been asked that question before, and it's a good one, because carbohydrates, simple carbohydrates, um, raise triglyceride levels. Triglyceride's the fat in your blood. Cholesterol's not a fat. It's a steroid. Um, but uh, the triglycerides are nutrients. They belong in our blood. But when we have too much of them, it's bad for us. And um, simple carbohydrates or pasta and things that can be broken down into simple carbohydrates are not good for us. Like that study, you know, the highest carbohydrate eaters in that recent study really did the worst of anybody. Um, and we're going to talk about this because there's a difference. It's not just the amounts you eat, but it's also good things that you eat. So it's not just what you don't eat. I'll show you in a sec. Um, another issue that's really important and to look out for in yourself and your friends, something in the elderly that's really common is depression. Depression is hugely common. What people don't know uh, as much is that sometimes when somebody looks like they're psychotic and you think, well, they're old, they're demented, they're psychotic, it's actually depression. When depression is really, um, really severe, it can present as psychosis. So it's really important to consider depression in anybody who seems like you know, they've lost touch with reality. It might have nothing to do with it, but it is common in the elderly and it's something to watch out for. The other problem in the, especially in the elderly, but still in everybody, I think, is the stigmatization of depression. And it frustrates me to no end. Um, a lot of people don't realize antidepressants are not addictive. They have no addiction potential. They're not regulated as addictive medications. They take the more popular categories, take six to eight weeks, weeks to work. Um, they can increase the rate of suicide. There's a black box, which the FDA does for really important things. They can increase the rate of suicide within the first few weeks. Um, take a long time to work, but when they work, and they often do, they, um, they can produce phenomenal results. Some of the problems are people don't take them for long enough. You're supposed to take them if you start for at least nine months or a year. Um, but another problem is that I find people just don't go on them because they think that they can will away high um, depression. But in my mind, for people who have depression, um, you could have as much will away high blood pressure or high cholesterol as you could will away depression, which, by the way, there's, I believe, the majority of people in the United States get depression at least once, so more than 50%. At least some of the literature I've seen at least once in their lifetime. And there's even reactive depression, which is, you know, something terrible happens, like loss of a loved one. Um, and that can also, there's less literature in that, but that can be helped by antidepressants. But the stigma is so bad that there's many things that we use antidepressants for that have nothing to do with depression. A lot of my patients won't touch it because they say, well, that's an antidepressant. So, well, I'm giving it to you for nerve pain. They say, yeah. You know, but it says antidepressant. Well, it's used for that too. But in fact, that was probably its label because that's the first thing they studied it in. But to give you an example, um, there's, have people heard of things like phantom leg pain? You know, so people who have pain, who have lost their legs, who feel that they have pain in their legs, it's very, very difficult to treat. And so one of the types of drugs you can try for that are antidepressants. And um, I use that example to explain to people that when your mind tells you something is wrong, you can't distinguish between something that is physically wrong and something that is in your mind. You know, I'm not talking about when you're feeling upset about something, or so, I'm just talking about if, if your brain is telling you your hand hurts and your hand is fine, you won't be able, you can't distinguish the difference between the two. Um, it, as, as, as opposed to if something really, you know, you'd really hurt your hand. So 
Just a word about antidepressants is they're probably underutilized. Depression is largely underrecognized. And it's particularly tragic when people are psychotic and they're labeled as psychotic and really what they have is untreated, unrecognized depression. What is the difference between depression and anxiety? That's a good question. Um, first, they're a lot of times related. People who are depressed can have a lot of anxiety. People who have a lot of anxiety could be depressed. I never could figure out which one is the more important of the two, other than asking people to get an idea of which one bothers them most. But the treatments are the same. So for depression, you're looking for somebody who's feeling down. And they don't have to feel anxious. They can just feel down or blue. Um, another thing is what's called anhedonia, which is, have you heard of hedonism? You know, you just live for joy. Well, anhedonia is finding joy in nothing. And people with depression um, who say, you know, I used to really like to bake, and I just, it, I don't care anymore. I used to like to go out with my friends, and all I want to do is sit at home. That's anhedonia. Years ago, there was a study of 20 questions. Um, and they found, that asked about depression, and they found that those two questions, just those two, were able to screen very effectively for depression. After which you ask about other things. So, um, and to the best of my recollection, anxiety isn't one of the things you ask. There's, we, a very popular screening tool has nine questions in it. So if people answer yes to one of the first two questions, then we ask the other seven. Well, we ask all nine again, and we try to rate it on how frequently has this happened over the past two months, you know, every day, or most days, or hardly any days, you know. And we come up with a score, and at different levels, we can define how severe depression is. And um, we can actually, there, you can actually follow it to see how well you're treating depression. It's not the best way to do it. There's better instruments for that. But in primary care, a lot of primary care doctors will do that. Anxiety, a very different instrument. That has seven questions. And one of them, for example, is this feeling of impending doom. Like, you don't know why. So anxiety, by definition, is feeling anxious without a specific reason. You know, anyone who's in a burning house is going to be anxious, right? But anxiety is about having those feelings of anxiousness without a trigger. And they just come, and you have no control over them. And so um, those are screening tools that we use a lot in primary care, those two questionnaires. In fact, we're actually required to use the one for depression. I don't think we're required, but I wish we were, to use the one for anxiety. And not all depression and anxiety requires medication. First, not, people, some people aren't at a level where they require it, but there's also alternatives. And one of the better studied and more effective alternatives is called cognitive behavioral therapy. So cognitive behavioral therapy is not Freudian psychoanalysis or anything close to it. It's almost like it's hard to describe because it's hard to describe in the literature, and it varies a lot from practitioner to practitioner. Um, and a psychiatrist could tell you much better than I could. But the way I look at it is it's essentially a toolbox, a way to think that helps you return a reasonable context, a frame, to whatever you're thinking so that you can evaluate it more reasonably than you would without those tools. And cognitive behavioral therapy works, depends on the study, either as well as antidepressants or almost as well. But the two, psychotherapy and, um, and antidepressants, work better than either by themselves. That's been shown over and over again. Um, for anxiety, I think it's the same, although I don't know as much literature on that, that you could treat that with cognitive behavioral therapy that's very effective for anxiety. Um, and there are medications that are not addictive to treat anxiety. But I read something in the past few days which I thought was a great, was in a guideline, and it was a great statement. They said that um, drugs like Ativan and Xanax, the benzodiazepines, are to anxiety what opioids are to chronic pain. So basically, they're a terrible treatment for chronic things like chronic anxiety. 
For one thing, for the treatments for anxiety, um, a lot of people become resistant to that treatment over time. It's called tachyphylaxis. Um, but, and that doesn't happen as to the same degree with, let's say, antidepressants that are used to treat other anxiety disorders. I believe they might have some medications that treat both of them. You know, a lot of the ones that treat depression also treat anxiety. Exactly. Yeah, so there's the treatments, again, I run into this problem where someone will say, yes, I'm anxious, but I'm not depressed. I say, great, well, this will help. And they go, no, but it's an antidepressant. And you go around in circles because of the stigma. So in my conversations with people, I do my very best to disabuse them of the notion that any of this should be stigmatized. All right. Um, is there anything that, about what we've talked about that anyone has any questions on? Yeah. When we were talking about obesity, I lost, I, I started swimming, I lost 10 pounds, but, and my weight is what it was 30 years ago, but it moved. It was in the hips before, and now it's in the stomach, and right. I can't get rid of it, and I'm afraid that it, because it's closer to the heart, I don't know. No, it's natural process of aging, our lean body mass. We basically have more fat and less muscle as we get older. And the other thing that happens um, to all of us, and we all have the same equipment, is that our metabolism slows down, as you may have noticed. That you could be eating what you always thought was a reasonable diet and always kept you at a reasonable weight and all of a sudden you're gaining weight like crazy. And I have so many people who come into my office and they say, I must have something wrong with me because I'm gaining weight. And if you talk to them, they say, I haven't changed anything. Well, that's the problem. They haven't changed anything. So if you eat when you're, like, especially for men, if you eat when you're 50, what you did when you were 20, you will be morbidly obese because your metabolism really slows down over time. And by the way, regular exercise brings your metabolism up. It's called your basal metabolism, metabolism the degree to which your metabolism metabolism is working when you're not when you're not exercising okay so I want to talk a little bit about heart disease and we touched on cancer which is kind of interesting because cancer sort of frightens people more but there are certain things from heart disease that are worse than most cancers so for example people who have heart failure who develop heart failure which can happen from heart attacks that kill the heart muscle in places so the heart doesn't pump as well. It can happen for many different reasons. But um, when they have severe heart failure, their um, six-month prognosis for survival is as bad as some of the worst cancers. And some of them, their uh, mortality rate at one year is 50%. So heart disease, I think we're not as worried about it, but we should be, and particularly women. And I'll, and I'll show you why I say that. Um, so the risk factors for heart disease, I think we've really talked about pretty much all of them. Being physically inactive, <coughs> an unhealthy diet, smoking, being overweight or obese, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. Okay, I'm going to jump diabetes for a second. If you have a family history of early heart disease, which means before 55 in a man or before 65 in a woman, that defines premature um, heart disease. Um, women who have had preeclampsia during pregnancy, which is when they get really high blood pressure and other things, but they get really high blood pressure during pregnancy, um, and age, and particularly 55 or older for women, because before menopause, women's risk of heart disease is much lower than men, and after menopause, they largely catch up. So it's after menopause that you really, really would want to focus on healthy lifestyle to minimize this, you know, that, it, that effect. So what's interesting about diabetes and pre-diabetes, so much the same way that we know from epidemiological studies that blood pressure go mortality just keeps on going up continuously. It's not some magical number at which it's bad and everything before that is good. It seems the same is true with glucose. And it's likely that glucose below the threshold that we develop, uh, that, we, that we define as diabetes, is still harmful. And so we've defined a range of glucose called prediabetes, which is associated with worse outcomes in some recent studies. Perhaps its strongest association is with the future development of diabetes. 
But prediabetes by itself, you should know, if someone tells you prediabetes, and so many people do, it does not mean that you're going to get diabetes. Um, and what it means is that you really want to pay more attention to those things that we've been talking about because the level of glucose is too high in your blood. And whether it's because of you, or what, the way you live, or because of your genes, or both, you want to do everything that you can do to be as healthy as you can to keep the sugar as low as you can. And um, that's actually something I should have said before with the treatment of high blood pressure, high cholesterol, high sugar. Um, you still have to do all of those things that you were doing that, that um, we were talking about doing, even if you're taking medications. So you definitely always have some people who will, well, I'm on a high blood pressure pill. I can just eat as much salt as I want. Um, I'm on a cholesterol pill. I could have hamburgers and french fries all day long. I mean, really, people do believe this. And I can understand the logic. So the point of bringing it up is all of these um, recommendations for these treatments all say the same thing. People need to be optimizing a healthy lifestyle while they're being treated. So it's not a pass of any kind. Um, some people with prediabetes, we actually treat with the same drug that we use as first line in people who have diabetes, because it can help to prevent the onset of diabetes. But again, the reason why people may have diabetes, if they have extra fat tissue, it opposes the action of insulin. If they don't exercise, their basal metabolism is lower, and they're not consuming as much insulin. So I use this a lot to explain to people, you know, let's say you're, you're 40 or you're 50. You've gotten this far. You've been lucky. But now you're seeing that your body is telling you you need to change. And you need to change what you're doing. And in some ways, a lot of it does seem to be a no harm, no foul kind of a deal, meaning that if you change these risk factors, um, and nothing had happened before then, you still get a lot of the benefit that you would have gotten if you, you'd been good from the very beginning. You know, it had always been really good. So, you know, if atherosclerosis, uh, the hardening of the arteries or uh, blockage of the arteries hasn't developed, but you're at risk for it, by lowering your risk, you, didn't, you don't have it. You know, so you, you, you know, can essentially make up for lost time at a certain point. Um, so what's interesting, if you want to talk about why heart disease is so important, as many as 400,000 premature deaths from heart disease and stroke in 2015 may have resulted from an unhealthy diet. That's almost as many soldiers as we lost in World War II. So, um, Interestingly, in one study that's come out, part of the risk resulted from a low consumption of healthy food. So we're talking about what not to eat. But then the flip side, as we're beginning to appreciate better and better, is what to eat. And in this study, anyway, um, of that excess death risk, they thought that 12% of it came from underconsumption of nuts and seeds, 12% from underconsumption of vegetables, and 10% from underconsumption of whole grade grains. Now, the literature in this is evolving. And I can't explain why that's the case, but I just want to touch on one thing you probably read a lot about, which is our intestinal bacteria. So um, I've never understood the concept of cleansing, because we don't typically have toxins in our body. And the bacteria in our colon are not toxins. They may not be the best mix of bacteria, but 90% of the, of the DNA in our body comes from bacteria that are in our colons, 90%. We're actually, they're hosting us. So um, you can try to adjust the mixture of diabetes with what are called probiotics. There are some things that they seem to really be important for in helping. In otherwise healthy individuals, I don't know of the benefit. I don't know of the harm. But again, you do do a first do no harm. But I just wonder the degree to which 
eating these types of foods that are described as healthy help you to have a healthier gut. It's called biome. And then in medicine, you don't get that many new words that frequently that are, are um, commonly used. And one of the new words that you might hear or see a diagnosis if you get your chart is called dysbiosis, which means that the mixture of bacteria in your intestine may not be optimal and be the cause of certain symptoms that you're having. So there was a question. Where would all that bacteria, how does that get alleviated? <coughs> or doesn't it just stay in the intestines and get like, clogged up? No, so um, basically it's almost like a jungle, right? There's some plants that are dying and some plants that are living and there's a struggle between different plants. It's good to think of your body that way. That's, so it's not a case of overgrowth, it's a case although that can happen. There can be such a thing called bacterial overgrowth, which makes people sick. But um, generally speaking, it's really some go away, some die, and some live. And it's the balance of the beneficial ones that may impact health in a significant way. We're just beginning to understand it. Although we've known this about the, the predominance of bacterial DNA in our bodies for a very long time, we've only begun to try to ask ourselves, what does that mean? And what can we do about that? So, so cleansing. If anybody ever tells you to cleanse, I don't know what that's supposed to achieve. And the other thing that um, you should be careful of is antibiotics. So you might have noticed that sometimes that you've been sick and you thought you had need an antibiotic, your doctor said, they didn't think you needed an antibiotic. It's a very common conversation that we have during the flu season when there's a lot of viruses around which are not treated by antibiotics. Um, but um, antibiotics are bad for the intestines, for the large colon. And people who have been on antibiotics can even develop an illness that could be life-threatening, um, which is an overgrowth of one specific kind of of bacteria. And that can actually happen even a couple of months after you've taken antibiotics. But it speaks to the redistribution of what's in your colon that, you know, as a result of antibiotics that might not be healthy for you. So there's a lot of reasons to not just take antibiotics, and that's one of them. Um, so we talked about this study about why DNA is not destiny. So um, this is about genes in the gym, right? Elements of a healthy lifestyle are fruits, vegetables, fish, whole grains, and nuts. Avoidance of tobacco. And in this guideline, they said exercising at least once a week. I mean, the, the optimal thing is at least three times a week for 30 minutes, as I told you, and then even two days of weight training. I saw a different guideline which said twice a week of intense exercise, 75 minutes or more. But there was a study that looked at people who only exercised on the weekends, weekend warriors, and found that whereas they did not do as well as people who exercised a lot, they did much better than people who didn't exercise at all. So again, exercise, if you find yourself in motion at all, you're doing something good. If you find yourself not in motion, staring at a TV screen, Hopefully the rest of the day you were in motion. Um, and the other thing they say here is not being obese. And in this study in which they were reducing the risk of heart disease to normal among people who had bad genes, they only had to do three or four of these things. So if I had to prioritize, the first one would be avoidance of tobacco. If you were going to pick three, start there. But it was only three of these things that were required for the people in this study to benefit. So you don't have to have an ideal body weight, an ideal diet, exercise all the time to derive benefit. So why I want to speak about heart disease in women, how much time do we have left? So I check. So really fast. Um, okay. Okay, women in studies have been, are much 
uh, more afraid of breast cancer than they are of heart disease, which is really odd because one in four women in the United States dies of heart disease, while one in 30 dies of breast cancer. 23% um, of women die within a year of having a heart attack. And part of that might be because they're older when they have a heart attack, but within six years of having a heart attack, 46% of women have heart failure, which is that problem I was telling you where the heart doesn't pump well enough. Now, they may not have such severe heart failure as I was describing, but that really decreases people's quality of life. And two-thirds of women who have a heart attack do not make a complete recovery. So there are women I know who get their mammogram every year, but they don't watch their diet and they don't go to the gym and they're overweight. And I actually don't understand because they're targeting this one in 30 chance of dying and they're missing the one in, 40, one in four. Um, and just to give you an idea, because we're all scared of cancer, it's so frightening, heart disease, in 2004, so I apologize because these numbers are old, but you can't always find updated numbers. Um, it, heart disease in 2004, the cause of death for, for 332,000 people, whereas all cancers combined, 265,000. Now, we do believe these are getting closer and closer as time goes on, but if you look at the types of lung cancer, 67,000 people died from, or 68,000 from lung cancer and 40,000 from breast. So actually, you know, to be fair, since both sexes can have lung cancer and only women, well, 99% of breast cancer is in women, um, you know, you have to consider that, but still, even if you consider the fact that 40,000 people were dying from breast cancer and divide the number in half of how many were dying from heart disease, you know, where is it, 332. So if you divide it in half, and you're talking about, let's say, 165,000 women dying from heart disease versus 40,000 dying from breast cancer. So you definitely should do your screening mammograms, and you definitely should do not smoke, and you should definitely do colonoscopy if you notice. Those are the top three up here. There's no, it's not a coincidence. Um, those are all important, but... Um, it's a really good question. Heart disease in women is a real problem because it doesn't show up classically the way heart disease. We're trained to look at heart disease in men or in, in people is really based on men. And there's much more clinical trial data um, for men than there is for women. So, but there isn't an effective screening tool aside from things like risk calculators, which I use all the time which are based on summation of data over decades, which tell you your risk of having a heart attack or stroke within 10 years. And I do that whenever anybody has high cholesterol, high blood sugar, that we, I put it in the calculator and I talk to them about, well, it's only 5%, but it should be 1%. Or it's over 10%, and most people would say you should be treated with a statin drug to lower your cholesterol. Okay, so this is it. Um, so I like this quote from Diane Ackerman said, I don't want to get to the end of my life and find that I've just lived the length of it. I want to have lived the width of it. And doing these things are the way, give you a much better chance of living the width of it. So some tips, start slow, set reasonable goals. Let the progress that you make be your incentive for continuing. You know, if, if you suddenly do a lot of things you haven't been doing before, just know that you know, injury is going to be counterproductive, will set you back further than you were. So set reasonable goals and start at a reasonable pace. And the concept of it takes a village, if everyone in the household is eating right, it's much easier than if you're the one who's eating right and other people aren't. And the same thing goes for exercise. They recommend that you exercise in groups because someone's always going to be motivated to exercise while everyone else is like, oh, do I really have to? So, you know, you take turns being the person who motivates, but it really seems that exercising as a group makes it more likely that you'll do it regularly. And um, we were talking about not indulging because you exercise. Um, and that dieting, meaning eating a healthy diet, helps with weight loss. Optimizing a, health a healthy lifestyle pretty much helps everything. So the simple things we were talking about, they reduce heart disease, they reduce stroke, they reduce some kinds of cancer. 
a lot of the things that um, work to reduce cholesterol, work to reduce blood sugar, work to reduce um, hy hy um, hypertension, these are really all connected. And you get to them all through the same way. The things that we've been talking about targets them all. And it's um, not rocket science. It doesn't, health doesn't come in a bottle. Supplements, cleansing, things like that. And any improvement in lifestyle that's appropriate improves health at, at whatever age people are, whatever their condition is. Mm -hmm. So um, I've heard and read that um, statins, if you take them for many years, they can up your blood sugar. Right. So um, uh, thank you for bringing that up. Statins are one of the biggest advances in medicine that we've ever had. When you lower someone's cholesterol with a statin, you actually get more benefit than you would expect from epidemiological studies of people who started out with that level that you reached with the statin. So um, people ask me if I mind the internet. I love the internet because everybody has researched a lot of background stuff and I can start an informed discussion. Whereas before then, um, when I was a lot younger, I used to start from the beginning about certain things that people now just read about. So they understand all the um, facts and questions and then they come in with you know, a perspective and a set of informed um, things they want to discuss. The problem with the internet is it doesn't give context often. It's so much easier to sell a news article about something that um, is bad than something that's good. And particularly if it's something that we use all the time, then it's a great headline to say, oh, that's terrible. The clinical trial data on statins started in the 1980s. We have huge amounts of high quality clinical trial data that support um, significant reductions um, in cardiovascular disease. And they're credited with a lot of the improvement in cardiovascular disease mortality we've seen, not all, but a lot, over the past few decades. There is a possible, it's not even proven, there is a possible increased risk of diabetes with long term use. So you have a very well characterized and large benefit and you have a poorly characterized in any event worst case scenario much smaller risk so it speaks to everything in medicine no medication you'll ever take has no risk there is no such thing it's always going to be weighing the risks against the benefits and in this case um, with statins it's not even close even the authors of a recent article who reviewed the data and said look there really might be this might be real said it, it really doesn't compare to the benefit. Okay. So Sorry. you don't recommend vitamins, health doesn't come in a bottle? You know, for people who are vitamin deficient, well, no, no, I'm, I'm serious. You know, if you're deficient in something like vitamin D or B12, then you need it. But if you're not, then the best analogy I can think of is you've got an eight gallon tank and you're trying to put 10 gallons of gas into it. It doesn't make a difference. Um, we keep studying this. We would love to think that vitamins are good. And we, I, over the years, hundreds of thousands of people, probably hundreds of millions of dollars in study, you know, to study vitamins. And we have yet to be able to prove that they make a difference and people aren't deficient. Um, although there are some signals of harm, like beta carotene and lung cancer. Um, there are some definite signals, not proven, of harm, but there's no real data on benefit. And it reminds me, um, Linus Pauling won the Nobel Prize in the 1920s because he described atomic orbitals. He was one of the most brilliant minds of the century. He almost discovered the structure of, uh, of DNA. Had he just flipped his molecule around, he would have been the most probably famous scientist you know, of, of that century. Um, and he spent, I think it was about 50 years, trying to prove the benefits of vitamin C. And he couldn't. So I'm thinking if you've got Linus Pauling in your corner and he can't prove it. Yeah. I have a question about osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. I was prescribed Fosamax. Mm -hmm. And I read all the, the side effects and all the stuff. And I'm scared to take it. 
So the scariest thing about Phosphomax and the bisphosphonates in general are the fact that if you don't take them right, they can really burn your esophagus. And that's the scariest thing. They're used um, very broadly. And the studies that have shown osteonecrosis of the jaw and the, and the strange kind of bone fractures, they're real. But you have to ask yourself how many people benefit versus how many people would experience those. Also, the studies of osteonecrosis in the jaw um, mostly came from, so the highest risk in cancer patients who get really high doses and only in specific, or mostly in specific kinds of cancer. So we've generalized that because it's definitely seen in osteoporosis. But the risk is really, really small compared to the benefit. It's not nothing. It's definitely not nothing. But again, the risk-benefit profile of, of statins, um, hip fractures, which they help to reduce, not statins, I'm sorry, I meant bisphosphonates, hip fractures, which they help to reduce, um, about 25% and these may be old statistics, but about 25% of people who have a hip fracture die from it. And about 50% of people who were living independently before a hip fracture are not living independently after it. And the pain that people get from frac spontaneous fractures in their spine really limits their quality of life. So the benefit of statins far exceeds that risk, even though the risk is real. And nowadays, we tend to give them for five years and then stop. OK, really quickly, because we have to end. But a little known fact, statins started out as industrial pipe cleaners. <laughs> they did. That class of drugs binds calcium. And in, in lectures by experts, you'll see them show these huge um, long tunnels that were full of, or tubes that were full of industrial gunk. And then afterwards, another where they're completely clean. You know, things that are as tall, tall as this room is what they look like, right? And that's that class called, stat, called bisphosphonates, which is what Phosphomax is part of. And what they do, our bones are constantly being broken down and rebuilt. That's the way it's supposed to work. There's an imbalance between that process, we think, that leads bones to be broken down more than they're built up, leading to lower bone density. And bisphosphonates bind to the bone and as far as we know, they kind of don't leave. Um, and, but they do stop the cells that break down the bone from doing that. Yeah, we really can't describe a half-life for statins. It's in decades. If we, we really can't figure out if they ever leave. But we do know that lots of people take them for decades, derive great benefit for, the, for a few people who are injured badly from them. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry for running long.